Welcome to the last session, uh, Future Security, uh, today. Um, so, uh, the devices we're working on are we sweating quite a lot to, uh, to uh, deal with uh, normal computers, but uh, we have uh, other types of computers that are looming for the computing. And in this context, we have uh, Drew, uh, who is a PhD student at uh, uh, Radboud University, working with Peter Fabe on practical uh, uh, post quantum cryptography, and uh, we'll talk about that now. Thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me in the back? Is this working? No complaint, so I'm assuming it's fine. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about post quantum crypto on the Cortex M4. So this talk is going to consist of a few separate parts. I'm going to give some brief context, like what are we up against? Then how does this work out on the F4, and then some more specifics on the, what kind of work do you actually do when you try to implement this sort of stuff. It's joint work with yeah, Peter and Matthias and Co, who are also in Nijmegen. Um, yeah, let's just get back to it. Last year you had a talk by Simona, who was talking about post quantum crypto for the IoT. Um, some of you might have seen that. Um, I'll try to not have too much overlap with this. Um, I'll have to cover some of the same basics, just to give context, but yeah. This is also out there if you want to see more of this look at last year. Um, so what are we up against? A large quantum computer can do all sorts of useful things. There's these promises that it can solve global warming and it can solve all sorts of physics simulations that yeah, cure diseases. Uh, and it can do not so great things, such as break our crypto. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I'll leave all of the, the quantum computing stuff uh, out of context now. And we're just going to focus on what does it do to our crypto. Um, RSA is completely broken. EC is completely broken. So when the crypto is broken, and when I say broken here, I mean that in a cryptographic, uh, cryptographic setting, like broken here means it's not what we expect it to be, but then an easy fix. I'll come to that in one or two slides. Um, the most important thing is that public key crypto, as you know, it's, it's going to change. So there's these two guys, uh, Love Grover and Peter Shore. Um, and there's two algorithms named after them. Uh, Grove's algorithm, it allows you to search in uh, order square of n. So traditionally, you would search through a large data set in order n, or search for some solution to a problem in order n. Now this gets like an exponential speed up, because you're searching in square of n. Um, this has effects on things like searching for keys, or searching for hash key images, or those kind of problems. Um, and they're sure, and he, his algorithm allows you to factorize um, Factor uh, uh, numbers into its prime factors in polynomial time. And for the mathematicians here, you might have some question marks here, like polynomial time, sure, what does that even mean? But this is actual practical polynomial time, so this uh, reduces your exponential time algorithms to something that's actually well fast. Um, and why do we care? Well, factorization is what underlies the RSA problem, so this breaks RSA, and it turns out that you can actually. Translate this algorithm into something that also solves the discrete logarithm problem, so there goes a little curve stuff as well. Um, like your fields, like your, your Algamal kind of, all those kind of protocols, the Hellman style stuff that you're used to. Um, so, yeah, this is an obvious problem. Um, does this mean that all is lost? Well, symmetric crypto is, is roughly fine. We saw this in earlier talks. Um, people are hinting at this. That's roughly okay. So, Go queries are expensive, so even the current AS128 that you're used to might be okay. Um, and even if you're not faithful in this, then you can just double your key size. Because order of magnitude uh, square root of n means if you double this in the exponent again, so you, you double the amount of bits, then you go back to well, what it used to be. Um, so that's generally fine. Symmetric, asymmetric crypto is now fun. There's a whole lot of stuff to do here. Um, there's also some other problems that we can base crypto on. The screen logarithm problem is not the only problem. So far, this has been something that people have looked at a lot. But there's all sorts of other stuff. There's lattices, and there's error correcting codes, there's multivariate quadratics, there's super singular isogenies, there's hashes. All sorts of interesting problems that you can also base your crypto on that have different properties. They're maybe not as fast or they're maybe not as small, but well, turns out you can actually use these for crypto as well. And if you're really desperate, there's also RSA. What if we scale this up immensely? Still works. Let's not go into this. Um, so, uh, to streamline this whole process, NIST, um, this uh, American Standardization Authority that has also standardized AES and recently SHA3, um, has called for, well, 
submissions for uh, a new like sort of standards towards having post one crypto. And the deadline for submissions was last year, so if you still have something lying around, maybe wait for the next one. But um, there's a lot of submissions right now, so 82 people, 82 submissions were sent in. 58 are still standing, because as is the case with uh, new crypto, also some stuff breaks. Um, but these 58 have been well, around for a while now, since uh, a few months after this deadline, I guess. So yeah, in crypto terms, it's not a while, I guess, but yeah. Uh, people are looking into these, and this is sort of starting to become a, a set of algorithms that people are investigating whether or not it's fast or whether or not it's secure. Um, and there's a couple of conferences on the way. Uh, earlier this year, we had the first PQ Crypto Standardization Conference, um, where people were presenting these schemes, right? So uh, the submissions uh, were all presented, and people could argue for or against them, and there was some discussion there. And there will be some fo more similar follow-up events, just as announced that summer of next year, they'll have the second round where yeah, they'll try to narrow this down a bit. And the goal is not to have just one standard, as was the case with AES or SHA-3, because for those, it's sort of clear-cut what they wanted, a block cipher that does this, or a hash function that has these properties. Here, it's a bit more vague, so what they're aiming for is some portfolio, like a set of algorithms that NIST sort of approves as this is what we're going to uh, recommend to people, allow people to use. So it's not a competition, it's sort of a yeah, lookout project. And how does this apply to the Internet of Things? We're here for IoT stuff. Um, well, it's the flexibility is always a bit of an issue here, right? It's like you bake something into your, your system, you deploy it in the wild, and it should run for a longer time. So in that sense, Pico Crypto is relevant. Well, you want your stuff to be around for a while. Um, but it's also a very active research field. So stuff is still breaking. Algorithms are getting adjusted, and it's not yet the standard. So in that sense, it depends a bit on your use case whether or not this is something you want to look into already. Um, but yeah, there's some discussion on key sizes. Everything is a bit bigger. Everything is maybe a bit slower. Uh, generally, people say it's big and it's slow. That's not always the case. Um, and this project is like looking at where do we stand right now? Um, how do we improve this? Uh, yeah, where do we go from there? So what we're looking at is the project M4. Many of you probably know this board. Uh, it's a SDM board. Um, and we're running a bunch of Pico Crypto stuff on this uh, board and testing it, benchmarking, seeing where this goes. Uh, this is a, a side project of a European funded project that looked into post quantum crypto in general. Uh, part of that looked at small devices, so this was sort of the, like the, the golden standard of what we call a small device. Um, yeah, this, this project is a deliverable from that uh, larger project. Um, what does this do? Well, we uh, have a build system that, uh, for example, that produces static libraries, so for each individual scheme um, it outputs a linkable file that you can just use for your key exchange or your signature scheme. Um, and then it has all sorts of tests and uh, like a, a, a harness around it um, to test whether it's correct, like it does a Stein verification routine or it exchanges a key with itself, um, and it compares test vectors. Right now it compares to a host device that's running the same thing. Um, we're working on something to compare to these NIST known answer tests, because NIST published a bunch of uh, like input-output pairs that should uh, match. But yeah, that's still a bit of a tricky situation. Um, but yeah, in principle that's what it does. And we, of course we run benchmarks, we measure how much tech all of these things use. Um, and we uh, try to get people to be able to integrate this into our framework quickly. And so we're accepting pull requests. Some schemes have already been submitted. We've added some ourselves. Yeah, uh, so a bunch of schemes that are right now in there. These might be meaningful names to you, probably not. Um, but yeah, some of these are well, considered more of the like, prime candidates of, of this competition. So in that sense, this should give you a, a general idea of where this is going to go. Um, so adding new schemes, yeah, this may not immediately very interesting. Um, but the idea is here that it's super simple to add new stuff. So we have this, either if you add a key exchange, so a key encapsulation mechanism, or a signature scheme, and then you specify <coughs> like what scheme is this, then either some optimized implementation, because we're very uh, leaving, uh, we're trying to motivate people to write code that's actually optimized for this platform, I'll come back, back to that in a bit, or like reference C code. So that's general code that should run anywhere and just produce the right output. Um, Create a make file and that's it. Um, and then, if it's a pure C code uh, implementation, then people can run this on the host as well, and then the framework automatically compares what you're doing on your laptop if that actually 
uh, matches what's happening on the device or whether all of this is compatible and stuff. Um, so yeah, that catches some issues if you're uh, not expecting a 32-bit device and a 64-bit host and stuff like that. That should all run. And then we have some optimized stuff like primitives that everybody uses. So it's a SHA-3, which is in all these schemes. Um, yeah, it, it, ma it makes a lot more sense if everybody just uses the same uh, uh, optimized version of these hash functions rather than doing their own stuff, because that's not something that's immediately relevant to us here. Um, so there's some ongoing work to do this on RhinoS. People at the University of Bremen, Sana and Jonas have uh, forked our projects and are uh, integrating this into Riot. That means that they're using um, what Riot offers to, to interface with the hardware rather than what we're doing, which is more of a hacky lip open CM3 kind of situation. Um, and they're also looking at how to do this on M0 and M3, which are similarly relevant platforms. We focus on M4, but yeah, you can imagine that you want to do some smaller devices, has some other implications for your stack space and stuff. Uh, that seems to be working all right for a lot, a lot of the schemes. Some schemes are turning out to be too big for the M3, but are fine on M4, so that's sort of an interesting play there. As we they also mentioned that not, not all of this is ready for production use. So if you're deploying this, be a bit careful. Maybe pair it up with some existing crypto. Um, but yeah, it's out there. Um, <coughs> could be nice to test, see if your application can actually handle all, all of this stuff. Um, yeah, so it's on GitHub. Uh, so a bit more details into what we're actually doing when we're uh, implementing optimized uh, post quantum crypto. What is this stuff actually about? I'll take an example of lattice-based schemes. They're one of the most popular uh, solutions right now to do key exchange. Uh, 28 of the 58, or maybe 28 of the 82, I'm not sure. <coughs> a lot of these NIST schemes are based on this lattice problem. Um, and I'll look in particular at our little lattices. And the idea here is that you're doing some arithmetic in a polynomial ring. So a structure where you're, uh, uh, you have some, some ring over polynomials. Um, and yeah, you're doing some, some multiplication or operations like that. Um, and this is actually very fast. Turns out that this is faster than the crypto we're using today. Uh, it's a bit larger. Like ciphertext and keys are an order of magnitude one to two kilobytes, whereas you might now be used to order of magnitude of dozens of bytes or tens of dozens of bytes. Um, but yeah, this is in principle postponed secure. Um, there are some question marks here and there what the assumptions here are, but I'll skip over that. Um, so what we're looking here, looking at here is how to do fast polynomial multiplication. So what we want to do to make this fast is find a way to multiply polynomials fast on this cortex and then forward. For yeah, polynomials that have coefficients mod q. So this is some structure over polynomials. So the polynomials are of some varying degree n. They're order of magnitude of maybe 500 to 1,000 coefficients. Um, and the coefficients are typically either mod some small, relatively small prime or some two to the power, uh, this should be a different n. This is not the same n. Um, this is order of magnitude of 13 bits, 14 bits, something like that. Um, and we're looking at this case in particular. Ah, this is where I actually changed the new case, which what it should have been. So we're looking at something like this, where uh, the coefficients are uh, uh, 14 bits or something, um, and we're doing them mod two to the case. So you can sort of picture how that would work. As soon as it overflows your 16-bit or your 32-bit int, then you can just truncate, right? Because you're doing mod some 2 to the k. That means you don't care about overflows. That's very nice. So how do you multiply these kind of polynomials? You take some large polynomial, and it depends very much on the degree n, like how big is this polynomial, how you're going to multiply this. Um, and that means breaking it down into smaller n. And the traditional way to like, do this is what we call schoolbook. You can sort of picture this if you multiply two polynomials, you would take all of the individual coefficients, multiply them individually with all the other ones. Not great, but it works. Um, so that's quadratic in how large your polynomial is. But there are some more dedicated algorithms that for larger polynomials allow you to sort of trade into smaller multiplications. Um, and what we're doing is we're just combining all of this into like, finding a way how to multiply efficiently. So say you have a polynomial that's 1,024 coefficients. They can sort of break that down using discard suba steps to trade them into smaller multiplications. Or you can do two and four, so I indicated two, three, or two and four. They split into three or four parts. And essentially, what you're doing here is you're uh, breaking your multiplication into smaller parts, but trading them for additions. So 
So you're adding uh, the map behind this is maybe a bit complex to capture in one or two slides, so I figured I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader, the watcher. Um, but the idea is that you're trading multiplications for additions, and that's good up to some extent, but as soon as they become very small, then these multiplications are cheap, and you're trading them for additions that are more expensive, so there's some threshold here. So roughly around like 10 to 20 coefficients, that's when you start using Google, because then this this quadratic complexity doesn't bite you as hard anymore. You can just start using schools. And what we did here is we implemented um, scripts that generate optimized assembly for arbitrary n. So the idea is here, all of these schemes use some polynomial multiplication for some m. Um, I'll, on the next slide, I'll have a bit of an overview. Uh, and we generated scripts that essentially combine these four approaches. And for arbitrary n, give you a uh, indicate which is actually the fastest approach. Um, so this allows you to very flexibly choose which approach you want to do and just get optimized code straight away um, for an arbitrary lab scheme, <coughs> essentially, that's doing these, these uh, polynomial <coughs> multiplications. And this graph you essentially see on the x-axis, there's the n, and on the y-axis, the number of cycles that this multiplication then takes. You see that at some point there's some crossovers where the different variants become more effective. Um, leads me to essentially the last slide, where we're presenting speed records. So these, you see that these Q's and N's all match what are previously sort of implied. All of these Q's are, well, not binary, but they're power of two. Um, and using these scripts, we can generate essentially the core problem in this, this scheme, namely the polynomial multiplication. For example, you see that here in Kindy, where essentially the encapsulation is just doing one of these polynomial multiplications, as the top around it. We get like a, what is it, factor 20 speed up just by like taking this one operation, just multiplying polynomials and writing dedicated assembly codes to, to, to approach this. Yeah, you see similar results across several uh, schemes. So that's, there's a lot of work to be done in post quantum crypto in that sense. Um, now we're just looking at value based key exchange, but all of these schemes have some interesting problem in the, in the core where if you start implementing this in assembly or really looking into this on your specific board, so what we did on the Cortex-M4, there's all these instructions that allow you to well, do multiplications and additions at the same time, for example. If you're familiar with like this R V7 assembly, then you might have seen this. Um, but yeah, uh, look at one of these problems in particular, really sit down, write the assembly, and then it can give you massive speedups. Um, that's what I wanted to briefly give an overview of this project. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's, GitHub, there's a page on GitHub where uh, looking for people that want to look at more of these schemes, because of course there's a dozen. Um, all of the code is public domain. Some of the schemes are MIT licensed, but in principle, everything we do is CC0. So feel free to pick it apart or add new stuff. And I'll be open to any questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Can some of these uh, post-quantum crypto approaches work for homomorphic encryption? I saw the lattice-based approaches, so you could potentially use it in multiple areas. Yeah, so there is some ongoing work on like looking how this, uh, what this does in, in more complex crypto primitives. Um, the NIST competition looks at what it does for signatures and key exchange, like key encapsulation. Um, in particular, like the lattice fields and the astrogenies and those kind of more structured approaches. Approaches have all sorts of other applications. I'm not really very familiar with this, but I, there's people looking into this for lattices. Um, MQ has some structures that allow like, these kind of things, but yeah, that's all very early stage. So right now, we're looking primarily at like the primitives. Signatures, key exchange. <coughs> but yeah, there's, of course, a ton of, of crypto primitives that need to be replaced, but that's very early. Other questions, maybe? Oh, I, I have one question. Um, so, um, as you know, we're working on Riot, which is uh, an, an OS. Um, how, if we want to prepare um, the OS for post-drafting, 
um, apart from waiting for uh, your uh, great optimizations, um, um, what what uh, what should you do in your opinion? What's, I guess what's the most interesting thing now to figure out is what are the requirements here? Like there's all these different trade-offs that you can make, either for making things fast or making things smaller or larger, or, and figuring out the actual use cases, but what are your your uh, your higher limits? Like how big can this thing go before it starts being a problem? Um, and then, yeah, uh, uh, selecting the right kind of scheme is then a, a sort of interesting dialogue between people standardizing this and you guys actually using this kind of stuff. Um, so in that sense, speaking up and uh, uh, testing these things, like does it actually work in your, your use case? Uh, which ones do, which ones don't? Uh, where are the limits? So that would be very valuable input. Um, yeah, just playing around with it, essentially. And using it, but not for production, but like, yeah, using it at home. Uh, that would be very valuable information. Yeah. Um, any other questions? No, then uh, that thanks Juice. <laughs> <laughs>